Hello, and welcome to Virtual ComTech 2020. I am Stephen Harris with the SET ISBE. And for the folks that know me, hello again. And for the folks I do not know, it's a pleasure to meet you. My capacity at SCTE ISBE is education, and that's in the form of learning and development solutions as well as professional certifications. My role is to drive business results through improved key performance indicators, as well as driving new skills and abilities and increasing the knowledge of the workforce. This role has allowed me to stay ahead of the technology curve, as well as be an ambassador for my organization, a consultant, facilitator, speaker, instructor, and in-house expert. I would also like to thank and mention the SET ISPE chapter here in Canada. Please visit their website for more events and cable opportunities. They are a great partner. Their website is SETE-Ontario.com. And today we will discuss cybersecurity, modern hackers, penetration testing, what's going on in the industry, as well as some of the defense mechanisms. So let's get started. So the internet has evolved into a vast array of interconnected networks uh, with exponential growth. We're all not gonna uh, argue that fact, as if you take a look in your own home, you have more connectivity than you've ever had. And think about our business customers, our cities, all growing for the future when it comes to connectivity. However, for, for our service providers, uh, securing a network for uh, integrity and resilience has emerged as a top priority. The boundless telecommunication experiences that our networks enable in the future with new and evolving technologies will require secure device delivery, without a doubt. This session will discuss the real story of the modern hackers, cybersecurity, testing, what's going on in the industry, and all that relationship to our industry. So let's take a look at our agenda. We will first start by looking at the attacks and who are the hackers, right? Then we'll focus our attention over to cybersecurity and the current state of the telecommunication industry. Then take a look at some of the defense mechanisms followed by the service elements. And these are the service elements of the modern network, public key infrastructure, Internet of Things, wireless, of course, Wi-Fi. How can we forget that, right? And popular layer two specifications, such as DOCSIS. Finally, the relationship of organizations like NIST here in the US, as well as the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. We'll take a look at these organizations and discuss their role. I'd like to first start with modern hackers. You know, who are these modern hackers and what are they doing? Before we dive right into that, let's take a little sidestep to the Hollywood modern attackers, right? These are, uh, or how Hollywood portrays our uh, hackers, right? And uh, we all have a favorite hacker movie. Mine happens to be Hackers, right? Uh, with Annalena uh, Jolie and Johnny Lee Miller here. Um, excellent movie, probably one of the, my uh, all-time favorites. And you can hear, and you can see here that there's ten things movie hackers always say, right? From I invented it to now we wait. But my personal favorite and one we probably don't want to hear is let the hacking begin, right? We don't want to hear that one. <laughs> but think about it. What's what's your favorite movie, All right? And uh, always a thrill to watch these. But let's look at real hackers. So real hackers, what's happening? Hackers are interested in data, but even more money, without a doubt. Hacking for money is referred to as a bank robber in modern days. Hacking for data is called corporate state. Maybe for personal benefit they hack for data or to sell to the highest bidder, right? Maybe I wanna get ahead of my career, so I'll use the data for personal benefit. Or I could hold it ransom. Cyber warfare or nation state is another form 
of hacking. Nation state examples are Stuck, Stuck.net, which was where a worm was able to control nuclear controls and really rendering that country um, in a poor situation. And then you have another country that just didn't like a movie put out by Hollywood. So they hacked into Sony Pictures. Interesting stuff. But maybe you're not a hacker. What do you do? Well, on the dark web, we have groups of hackers for hire. Most notably is Deathstalker. Now, he targets the financial industry. But the fact that remains, you can hire hackers. Now, you got crypto jackers that actually use part of your processor to, to actually mine uh, for different items. Maybe it's for cryptocurrency. But remember the old SETI screensaver search for extraterrestrial intelligence? That was using your processor too, except that it wasn't a uh, attack. You know, we allowed it to happen. But interestingly enough, how hackers are able to uh, use your processor too. Now, there's even more examples. How about rogue gamers? These are gamers that are playing and perhaps are not doing too well. Uh, so I'll decide to do a distributed denial of service to the other game players, so maybe I can have an edge, right? Uh, very interesting. All they want to do is win. You got hacktivists, you know, getting into the politics, not too much, but you could see a lot of this on the media, where we have folks that are, you know, really interested in, in using their abilities to drive political agendas. Then there are bot, bot masters. Now, a bot is a device on the network that's being controlled by a cyber criminal. Now, if you get a group of those that are controlled, you make a network or a botnet. And if you have that control, you become the master. And, and a master can turn around and rent out the whole thing to you and say, you know what, you want to rent a botnet? I'll, I'll rent it to you. And you can use that to do your attack. Very scary stuff. Uh, and ad, adware spammers, these are not good because they disturb our end users or our workforce trying to get things done. They actually reduce productivity by slowing down devices. So these aren't a good thing. You have social engineering, manipulating people to release information uh, because they think you work there or they think that uh, you're a partner of them. Uh, so that's not good. In phishing, phishing, I'm trying to grab some information from you. And these phishing attacks have got much more advanced by doing spear phishing, which are targeted to you and your interests. More on that soon. Now, application attacks. Um, these are a big part of a modern hacker. Uh, they account for close to half the attacks. Uh, we mentioned uh, distributed denial of service, uh, denial of service. Also, in info leaks are the most used in the telecommunication industry. And zero day attacks. What are these? These are attacks on a cable network on the same day that the vulnerability exists. So that means you've got to be very uh, up to date on what's going on with security because not only have to, have to figure out the new vulnerability you have to actually apply the patch right away so somebody doesn't get in there and install some malware or some hacking tools so this these create back doors so you have to be on top of it now to uh, add to application attacks uh, we also have uh, the bot and the botnets what I mentioned with the botnet master um, and these could be compromised through malware. We'll talk a little bit more about malware. Um, on top of that, you have people that write code, and that could be an SQL injection, a, a structured query language injection that, that disrupts a database. And we all have huge databases, customer databases, and data on our customers to drive and position products. So it's very, very important that these are you know, five nines of uptime for us. Um, and even destroy and or in, disrupt our credibility on the web by injecting scripts into a website. You know, so there's many, many uh, trends there. And then on top of that, you have web skimmers that actually get code into a server and to skim off credit cards. So people are going to your website buying something. Meanwhile, a hacker is skimming those credit cards for themselves. Uh, so another scary situation because it's up 187%. Uh-oh, sounds like I'm getting attacked right now. Whoa. Uh, there are many data breaches uh, reported in the news. Close to a quarter of the attacks uh, are created by these hack by hackers and stuff. Um, there's a list of these uh, breaches. Most of them are happened from uh, weak passwords. Uh, users don't want to use strong passwords. They can't remember them. 
uh, or they're doing authentication hacking, or credentials are shared out on the on the web. Uh, these are all reasons why passwords uh, make the top of the list. Now you have social engineering. I don't know if you remember Captain Crunch at all, but he he was a uh, hacker early in the day that actually took a um, whistle out of the Captain Crunch cereal and made it into a tone generator to make free phone calls. Later on, uh, to continue his hacking, he decided to do social engineering where he pretended to work at the telco to get access to systems in other areas uh, past uh, tone generation. And there's word on the street that other high profile people were doing some tone generation back in the day. Um, too many permissions, this has happened. Uh, look, look at Twitter. You know, some of the users internal had too much uh, permissions and therefore com um, several high profile people, their, their accounts were compromised. Uh, Bill Gates being one of them. And so if they didn't have that permission, um, that, that could have prevented some of the, um, the accounts being taken over. And then you have users that are new. Uh, maybe they're new to security or they're not up to, up to speed on all the security um, lingo or processes or best practices. And so you get improper configuration or poor scripting um, or just user error. You know, I, I oh, I, I, sorry, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. So that's, that's, a, that's a big problem too. So education, um, and you could get that over here at the SETE is, is key for that. Now, you think about malware. Malware, you're typically like, you're thinking in your head, all right, malware, yeah, it comes through email, I got that locked down, and it's typically right. 90% of malware comes through email. Uh, however, uh, some of the newer sources of malware are coming through uh, fileless. This is a new trend, and pretty scary. But this is a tack code that lives in RAM, and so you gotta be watching that as well. Um, other malware forms, we talked about crypto mining and crypto jacking early on uh, in my SETI example, but basically it is taking transactions from various forms of cryptocurrency and then compromising them before they're added to a blockchain, blockchain uh, digital ledger. Um, exploiting vulnerabilities allow you to do zero day attacks, install uh, software, uh, create bots using malware, and um, the last one is hacking tools, even install hacking tools uh, through vulnerabilities. And this is up 224%, the hacking tools. Um, so again, this allows for uh, malicious payloads and increasing the weaknesses within your systems and, and networks. Whoa, um, we got ransomware here. Encrypts valuable files, typically. That's a crypto uh, ransomware. However, there's a new trend where we lock you out of your system. More of a locker ransomware. So what you, the idea is you would pay money to the, um, the criminal um, and basically unlock your computer, right? Uh, and that's called the locker. And a crypto locker is a very for, uh, a form of that. Uh, WannaCry is another form of crypto ransomware. And you got Locky out there as well. So keep a lookout for ransomware. These are very, very popular. And you say, well, how popular? Uh, in 2019, uh, it's cost Canadians their companies upward to 2.3 billion. Wow. Um, if that's not enough, and, and, and if you're really looking at, well, you know, I don't know if that's, that's, that's that serious. Well, it is pretty serious because it locks systems until a ransom is paid and doesn't mean it's being unlocked. Now there's also a cyber insurance provider coalition and they claim to have 25,000 small and medium businesses. And with that, with what they're saying is that 41% of their U.S. Canadian customers uh, are related to ransomware. Their claims are related to ransom, ransomware. So that's that's uh, trending in the wrong way as well. We also have uh, phishing, and there's several forms of phishing. So phishing is just a general, um, maybe it's a text message or an email saying, "Hey, you won the lottery. Uh, you need to claim your ticket." Whereas spear phishing, it says, hey, Steve, you won the lottery. Um, and from my town, and, and maybe it's also has my street in there. So it, it's targeted. Or maybe it's targeting my interests. Because uh, they know I actually like to do surf fishing. And they might say, oh, you want a fishing pole uh, from the bait shop you go to. And it's like, oh, wow, I can't believe it. I, I can't believe they're giving away a, a, a fishing pole. Uh, so that's pretty pretty serious stuff too, and and that's where they get a lot of people because you think you won the RV or you won the the prize and you want to claim it. 
Um, there's also whaling where you go after executives and, and going after the executives, you can get, get uh, a bigger payback or a bigger payday, if you will. Uh, and when I use SMS or text messaging, I'm smishing. And when I'm using voice calls to, to uh, fish you, then I'm using vishing. Okay. Wait, wait, what's that? Whoa, I got a call in from Toronto, and it says scam likely. Uh, so, again, they could use voice calls, uh, just like here, and luckily I'm, I'm not going to answer that. Um, but recently I mentioned the in-house tools used at Twitter were compromised, uh, and this was spear phishing. Okay, this was spear phishing. And now you had Bill Gates' account... Um, uh, overtaken, as well as our uh, Democratic hopeful. Uh, his account was taken taken over, a reality star. So now you think you're getting uh, tweets from Kim Kardashian. Well, you're not. You're not. You're getting it from a hacker that's compromised that account. It's kind of like whaling because you actually trust these people and these celebrities and you're thinking, wow, that's great that they're contacting me. <laughs> whoa, whoa, there we go. Uh, we got man in the middle. Uh, attack. So, so in this example, we have a uh, source, which is our DOCSIS CMTS or our CCAP device, Converge Cable Access Platform. Um, we have a victim cable modem in, in this example, and then somebody like a hacker sitting in between, and they're eavesdropping on the network. So the, the, the scary thing about this is that the victim has no idea that this line has been compromised. And so that's, that's, the good thing is you don't have to worry with DOCSIS. DOCSIS has this under control. But uh, you might be using other technology that you'll have to kind of keep an eye on this, right? Maybe you have an ODN and you'll have to look into that. Also be aware of other technologies. There's actually a Blurtooth attack using Bluetooth and basically allows me to uh, reduce encryption keys as well as overwrite authentication keys. So this allows eavesdropping as well in Bluetooth. So one thing you could do is disable that or, or use the uh, latest version of Bluetooth. So that brings us over to cybersecurity, the current state. You know, what are some of the current events in cybersecurity? Well, you don't have to look far, and, and we're going to cover a lot of them. Um, but, you know, a lot of the, the, the ones that are related, not, not a lot of them. We're not going to, we're going to get to the good stuff. Um, but... Based on the venture capital dollars invested on cybersecurity, you can see the top four countries investing in this order. So United States makes sense, Israel, United Kingdom, and Great for Canada, they're one of the top four investors in cybersecurity. And that's important because they're the top three attacked in the world. Um, so that makes sense to me. This is a scary part that uh, 3.5 million unfulfilled cybersecurity jobs. Well, that's up from a million that Cisco shared in 2014, and it's trending that way. So that's not good. This is enough people to fill 50 NFL stadiums. So we need to have qualified people. We need to have educated people. Um, again, uh, that's, that's our function. That's our role in the industry. A, some other key facts here. Um, unemployment rate is at 0% since in, in, 19, in 2019. Well, I'm going to say it's probably 20, 2020 as well, 0%. Why? It's been that way since 2011 for, for nine years. So if, you, if you're in this industry, you're going to have a, a, a very decent career because we can't get enough of these people. Now, who's best prepared for attacks against cybersecurity or cyber attacks? Canada is listed here, number 10. And that's based on a GCI score, which is a Global Cybersecurity Index and this is created by the International Telecommunication Union. And basically it looks at five uh, key areas, legal, technical, organizational, capacity building, and cooperation on a scale of zero to one. Um, so this is good. Again, uh, being one of the top investors in cyber and also being best prepared is good because Canada is the third most uh, cyber incidents, okay? So very, very interesting statistics there. Um, other statistics, just to share a few, you have um, attacks uh, that exploit vulnerabilities. And these are vulnerabilities where uh, patches exist, but are not applied. 
There's 11,000 vulnerabilities on the list right now in the database. That's pretty scary. 90% uh, of remote code execution attacks are associated with crypto mining. And 94% of malware is delivered via email. That's up. Um, we also talked about uh, the trend of fileless, um, which is down here. Those attacks grew by 256%. Scary stuff. Uh, phishing. Uh, in particular, spear phishing, top security concern uh, and threat. $17,700 is lost every minute due phishing. $17,700 uh, US dollars lost every minute due to phishing. And as far as uh, ransomware, you can see trillions of dollars. Trillions of dollars costing a company up to upwards of $5 million, which is... Uh, not good. So you can very easily go in the news and search ransomware attacks in Canada. They come up. So data breaches cost uh, enterprises an average of $3.92 million. Uh, compliance used to drive cybersecurity spending. It's down 3% because people are trying to uh, reduce uh, their risk with uh, ransomware and phishing and some of these others. But still driving majority of the cost, right? Which is uh, important. Now, 25% of organizations have a standalone uh, department, but 75% do not. So some of our business customers are going to be relying on cable operators to keep them secure. And of course, this one makes sense. 40% of IT leaders said they can't get enough people to fill the jobs. And this one makes sense. IoT is tripled. The thing with IoT is you have to make sure that you're using trusted vendors. And you have to make sure that people are using IoT devices on your network that are well vetted. Uh, there's more and more IoT devices, but, but they're not all the same. And this is another scary one, hardware or silicon level security breaches. They're up. Now, uh, for Canada, uh, the Canadian Internet Registry Authority, 87% of Canadian households are connected. Okay, that's 16th globally. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that... Uh, that's, that's good, uh, but that's more people to protect. Look at the last bullet I have here. 100% of Canadian organizations experienced a cybersecurity attack last year. 12.5 breaches per year. Wow. Um, so pretty, pretty scary stuff there. As far as costs go, you can see the cost, $14 billion in Canada, and that's $8 billion in salaries. $4 billion in software and hardware, as well as $2 billion in other measures. If you look at it on a worldwide scale, that's 133.7 billion. Get the cash register out because the costs that I mentioned are very, very expensive. Um, and again, we talked about the six trillion. Um, and you know, cybers uh, attackers exploit vulnerabilities. This is one of the um, top threats. It's 25% of the, the threats. Uh, high threat of data breaches. But the key thing here is you can see that this is a focus for us, the telecommunication industry. How about we look at distributed or distribution of breaches by business group and business subgroup reported. Now, we can clearly look at this and say, yes, I am operating in business, education more and more because of COVID. I'm in the government area. I'm in medical with telehealth, telemedicine. Um, you know, SET is very focused on uh, these in our SETE Standards Explorer program. So definitely check that out, as well as smart cities, IoT, and some other things I'm mentioning. Because we feel that we need to make sure we have uh, standards in place to protect these networks, right? They have to operate well, but they also have to be secure. Now, if we just take a look at one subsector, tech, you know, that's a pretty big area. But look at business. It's a huge area, and these are our business customers. They, and we just said 75% of them don't have an IT department uh, that's dedicated to cybersecurity. So where are they going to get the help? That's us. And business customers pay very well, and they're good customers, meaning that it's a good growth area for us. So we need to take care of our business customers when it comes to security. Obviously, uh, medical, and I'll show you a breach on medical, uh, that could actually take out a hospital. Now, if you look at the travel industry, the hotel industry, um, you know, Marriott, poor Marriott, they had the largest breach in history, in history in 2018, 5 
hundred million people. Now this was related to their Starwood acquisition. The Starwood database was compromised. However, it doesn't matter. In London, they're having a lawsuit against Marriott, even though it wasn't their database. But this drives home uh, the point that you have to secure uh, your acquisitions, right? And take a look at this one in 2020, another attack. They use the credentials of two franchise owners to attack again. And so you have to also look at your franchises, your contractors, uh, partners, and make sure all these pieces are secure. Now I mentioned um, ransomware attacks already, but I also talked about uh, healthcare. And this is pretty serious. When you paralyze a hospital, you paralyze a government, multinational corporations are paralyzed. The stuff is self-spreading. This is what we're dealing with. Very, very, very scary stuff. So it's important that you know, as we look at cybersecurity, uh, we also look at these other sectors and making sure that our, our services uh, protect as much as possible against these types of attacks. So what's going on in Canada nowadays? Well, this is just from, this is from August. Uh, thousands of Canadian governments attack, or Canadian government attack, uh, accounts attacked, can't talk. And that's the Canadian Revenue Agency um, down here that was attacked in September. So um, very interesting stuff um, to be aware of. You have ransomware hits a trucking company. You know, so this is supply chain. You have uh, students being attacked, 250K. You have 200,000 nurses being held hostage on the dark web with their data. So there's a lot going on. Now we talked about this one last year. Uh, a lot of us use planes, um, and a lot of us used uh, probably use Air Canada. Twenty thousand uh, customers were compromised, and that's also to, to note two thousand three hundred bookings um, through Air Canada um, hotel options have been involved in the data breach as well. So no sector is is uh, exempt from what's going on. Um, so. Uh, you know, here's what they did. They actually, um, you know, it's making sure you change your password because they, that was compromised. But again, it's not just one industry. It's many, many industries. So let's look at the current state in telecom. So a percentage of Canadian enterprises having chosen this reason as a main one, put a little E there, to implement security measures. Well... That makes sense. Protect information, 68%. Now, this is from Statistics Canada. Uh, obviously, fraud and theft. We don't want to have theft of services from an internal perspective, external perspective. Uh, secure continuity. We don't want downtime. You know, we want reliable networks. So here's a lot of uh, these you can kind of go through at your leisure, uh, but kind of gives you um, an idea of why we're doing security. Now, our community must have a security mindset. And that's from the point at which our devices and services are designed to protect our customer and employee data and product security. So this has to be from the beginning. We can't just grab off the self, self uh, solutions. We have to use off the shelf secure solutions. Okay. Um, you know, if you see, we talked about the Canadian population online today, there's huge growth in 1G. What that means is there's more people getting faster compute power, more speed, so the attacks are going to get more advanced. Um, you know, 10G uh, has reduced latency, enhanced reliability, uh, but that also opens a door to a whole bunch of new services that we want to give our customers. So that's why new security features, big driver here. And we'll talk a little bit about Doxis 4.0 and what's going on there. Um, and, you know, we're, we're enabling millions of user experiences. And that's Wi-Fi, IoT, that's Layer 2. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we have to secure. Now, the attacks are imminent. That means they're coming. We have to be ready as, as operators, as vendors, uh, working together with SCTE uh, to making these attacks expensive. When they're expensive, that will actually reduce these attacks. 
Obviously, you could never reduce 100% of them. Uh, but reducing some of the um, smaller ones, very, very helpful. The less we have, the better. Uh, reducing vulnerabilities, exploited software vulnerabilities. Also looking at hardware, in particular Rowhammer, which um, is, is a vulnerability in DRAM, dynamic re, uh, random access memory. Uh, we must agree on the meaning of security. We all must be working together so we implement the same security um, and, and business rules. Our adversaries will try to ha hijack code. They will do this. Uh, they are after the infrastructure. They're after the power, especially as we move stuff from our modular head and architecture into the access network. We now have compute, edge computing in the access network that we need to worry about. Whoa, that's serious stuff. Serious stuff. Um, again, security engineers should identify security problems by thinking offensively. Okay, what would my attackers do? Threat analysis, look at misuse cases, vulnerability scanning, penetration testing, all things that we should be aware of. Uh, strategies can, uh, to use to develop a more secure user, user experience. So some of the strategies could be adopt a framework, which I'm going to talk about. And you may already have one. Uh, using zone defenses, so everybody doesn't have access to everything. Um, Role-based security could fit in there as well. Uh, communication with associations using a public key infrastructure and penetration testing. And we'll take a look at that. So one of the most popular uh, models for a cybersecurity framework is the National Institution of Standards and Technology. Um, and this is called NIST for short, but it's a cybersecurity framework. And it starts up here with identifying which assets. It's only five steps. And you work your way clockwise. Okay, protect which safeguards are in place. Then detect or ID incidents. Then respond with a um, plan or contain the impact and restore capabilities. That's the idea. That's the thinking here with the model. And this is adopted internationally as well. Uh, for us in Canada, we have the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. And... Uh, started and established in 2018. I'm going to show you a short video on it. Um, and they are the authority for cybersecurity in Canada. We also have the U.S. Cyber Resilience Review, another uh, uh, agency, part of our homeland security here in the United States. You have NISA, which is the European Union Agency for Network and Information Security. Um, and also we see data suggesting that Latin America region is open to adopting some of the U.S. Uh, cybersecurity uh, risk management frameworks. Now, don't worry, there's also proprietary approaches, um, and, and that's from every major information and communication technology company, uh, or ICT for short, and there's an example of it right there. Okay, So let's take a little look at the uh, Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Nicely done. They did a nice job with the video. But these are the authority for Canada. These folks here. So, as well as um, US has a model, so does Canada. It's called the Cy Cybersecurity Framework Core. And you can see uh, here identifying assets, evaluation. Um, you can see apply and monitor, respond, and then we have um, make adjustments. So uh, that's a good resource for you, as well as uh, fundamentals for uh, 
cybersecurity for Canadian critical infrastructure community. A good little read there. These are both free. Hit me up afterwards and I can point you um, to, to this document here. Besides that, we also have, uh, we talked about industry collaboration, right? Uh, there's also um, cyber defense tools that are available, common criteria for certifying IT products, um, you know, cryptographic, uh, cryptographic module validation program and communication security called ComSec. Uh, ComSec is comprised of multiple disciplines as well. Uh, cryptographic security, they have emission security, trans transmission security, as well as physical security. Um, we also have communication security. Uh, so there's a lot of things there um, that you can, a lot of tools that you can leverage. Now, how many of us out there have a computer security incident response team or a CERT organization or a CERT uh, department at your organization, right? Um, this is important because these are the folks that are going to uh, investigate security incidents at your organization. Uh, they're going to provide proactive threat assessments, mitigate, uh, do planning um, for mitigation. They're going to do incident uh, trend analysis, security architecture review, and things like that. Um, a playbook is recommended by, by your CERT team to, to keep a collection of repeatable queries against security events. Uh, you'll also have security information and event management tools. We'll take a look um, at, at an example stack for that coming up next. You, you also have to look at data loss prevention program to stop sensitive data from being stolen. That's internal or external, right? Um, we don't want things escaping the network. Um, and especially your intellectual property. Uh, and then role-based access. That could have helped uh, Twitter, right? All right, so adopting a security stack. Uh, here is Michael uh, Overlander's example. But as you can see, it's, uh, it's, it's OSI and what you do at each layer of the OSI. But it goes a little step further where it's a you know expands the security scope into user management and money, right? Because there is, um, you know, versus you have risk versus um, value, meaning I can't secure everything. You know, I, I would go broke, but so I have to kind of access the the risk, so I, I don't overspend. Uh, but I, again, I don't want to un underspend as well. Um, but this kind of gives you a, a good example uh, for adopting a security stack, right? And he's a pretty smart guy, and he has a great book out too. So you could look up his book if you want to get that. Um, there are different laws that protect your privacy and data in your country. Um, but the big question is, where is your data? And, and that's why we have these in place. So in Canada, it's called Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, um, as well as uh, Canada has a Privacy Act. In U.S., we have multiple organizations. One is um, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which we call HIPAA. Uh, but that's separate from our financial acts, like Financial Services Moder Modernization Act uh, or Federal Trade Commission Act. Um, also to mention, there's a white paper available. Uh, this was written for Angacom in Germany last year when we talked about security. Uh, this is a free download as well. Uh, you should be able to search by title. If not, hit me up uh, here on the email or hit me up afterwards and I'll get it to you. Defense, so let's talk about the defense. So some of the defense, zoning, logical and physical separation. Um, of the services and assets, use whitelist access, secure departments, remote access must be secure. Uh, remote accounts, use separate credentials, unique passwords. You know, vendor and cloud, they're separated. Separate certificates and private key crypto. Uh, trust zones in a network where no system is directly accessible to another. Laptops should not be connected to one another. They should not be doing network shares. Uh, provide human access, not all in one network systems. So use tools like CAPTCHA. And then patch everything. I got an alert there. Patch everything. Everything needs a patch. You know, and make sure you test the patches. Right? You don't want to patch everything and then throw it out in production. Uh, but everything should be secure. 
Uh, use secure channels of communication, create security associations using public key infrastructure, leveraging a AAA uh, server that's going to provide authenticated and authorized uh, traffic. Strong identity uh, allows associations to be isolated and confidential, which we're getting to the CIA triad, right? Uh, and, and this all has to be by design. Only expose portions of your network uh, as needed. Uh, security associations uh, must be attested, which means they must be audited and verified and validated. Uh, use a managed public key infrastructure for identity management down here, identifying users of the network. And that brings us to the CIA triad, which you're probably thinking of the Central Intelligence uh, Agency. Uh, but we're really talking about confidentiality, um, in integrity, and availability. Okay. And this is kind of a model to guide us, and let's take a look at more detail. Oh, what's going on? What happened? Looks like the head end went out, and no one has video. And you can see clearly on your, their monitors, they're all out. Uh, information must be accessible uh, when needed. If the head end is not available uh, because of a denial of service attack, then the end user is not consuming content, and they're going to be calling us. Uh, so this is very, very important to make sure you have availability in your network and to only allow, allow access to users. Confidentiality, uh, another portion here, privacy using authentication encryption. We don't want uh, rogue people coming in and accessing content um, or accessing information within the network. And you can see here, these folks are using keys, which we're making sure they're authenticated. We're making sure the traffic is encrypted, okay? And that's all part of uh, public key infrastructure. And then we got integrity. The data that we are looking for, is it accurate? Is it trustworthy? And we got to make sure that we have that. And that's also done through PKI. So let's take a look at PKI, public key infrastructure. The idea is that we take data, uh, we use asymmetric keys, which is a, is a private and public key. They're different keys versus a symmetrical key, which is the same key. And we sign and create a signature that we can now decrypt that signature and verify that the data is it has integrity, it's trustworthy. Yes, it is It is our data. Uh, you cannot reverse it. You can't take the public key and go back and work it that way. It has to be done one way, okay? But this is a good way of verifying integrity and trustworthiness. You could use public key infrastructure um, on your Wi-Fi networks. You could use a managed uh, version of PKI and so for a business customer, enabling a certificate service that holds a private key and Wi-Fi clients that use a public key to have secure transmissions in your networks. Excellent idea. And if we take a look at the hierarchy, uh, PKI works in a hierarchy where you have a root server or root certificate authority. And then underneath that, you have certificate authorities. And below that, you have sub-certificate authorities. Now, our DOCSIS specification leverages these hierarchies. So we'll get more on that soon but just wanted to give you some more detail. So manage PKI, uh, in this example, you can see on the left-hand side, we have a public key using a, a secure hash algorithm of 256 bit. And that's, and that's what's leveraged in DOCSIS 3.1. That provides a hash and then using a private key, now we can look at that signature and, and make sure, um, I'm sorry, using the hash, we use the private key to, to, to sign it and create the signature. So we can use the keys to look at certification data and look at the signature and they both go back to the digital certificate. So now we have integrity and authenticity. We may also use the keys to validate. You know, so we have a digital certificate, we have um, the signature and data from the last example. I decrypt the signature. I use the hash on the certificate data. I compare the hashes, are they valid? And now I can provide integrity. Uh-oh. All right. Well, the, the idea here is test telecommunication ideas and solutions. Because our adversaries will. And the, the, the notion is to use penetration testing. Uh, a basic vulnerability scanner is available for free. It's Kali Linux. You can download that at no cost. And that will allow you to do several uh, tests. I'm going to show you here. Uh, static code analysis scanning, it scans th uh, through 
a CVE, which is a Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures Database. Remember, we talked about 11,000 of those uh, that exist. And along with, um, I can look at poor programming practices with static code. Now, dynamic code analysis uh, runs on a host as a process watching for anomalies and behaviors and also watches the CVE. So a little bit stronger than the static. And fuzzing sends malformed packets to processes testing for insecure states. So definitely want to do penetration testing on your designs. So let's look at some layer two stuff. Hardening IoT, there's no question uh, you're going to harden IoT, use trusted vendors. Uh, you, know, you can see very clearly 61% of organizations have experienced an IoT attack. Uh, and we're waiting for new uh, data to come out. Use the tested devices. Make sure you're working with trusted manufacturers. Um, as you get into more smart city, you might get into outdoor lighting, energy management, utility monitoring, and the stakes will be higher. So it's good to start now. Harden up your Wi-Fi. That means making sure you're not using default presets, not default passwords. Use VPN tunnels when, when available. Uh, do not use Bluetooth um, for wireless um, unless you're using the current version. Uh, additional things you could do to harden Wi-Fi. Shared key is legacy. Stop using it. Use newer versions of Wi-Fi like Wi-Fi 6. We'll put that little I in there. Uh, hardened form of, or highest form rather, of WPA. In my example, I have WPA3. Or go to WPA2, the highest you can support. We don't want Wi-Fi protected setup. It's legacy. And for our business customers, enterprise Wi-Fi. Keep software up to date. Very, very important. Keep software up to date. For Layer 2 Doxis, we have our uh, baseline privacy interface. Been around for quite some time, 56-bit security for encrypting. Uh, but now we have public key uh, infrastructure, PKI, we talked about. Uh, we also have um, what we call early authentication and encryption available in BPI Plus version 1. And we have a bunch of new features coming in BPI version 2 for Doxis 4 uh, that we're going to talk about shortly. And we also have the ability to do authorization and authentication. And you can see an authorization exchange here on the left-hand side uh, for uh, BPI version 1. Okay, that's what this one is. Okay. Uh, just a little bit more flavor here. You know, BPI was DES. Um, and now moving into BPI version 1, we, we support uh, EAE. So we can actually look at... Um, Securing much earlier, which enables soft, secure software download, which we'll take a look at. Triple DAS at 168-bit. Uh, we can do BPI enforce to stop uh, MAC address cloning. So more features were added. But in, in version 2, we have perfect forward secrecy. We have mutual message authentication. And we have downgrade uh, protection for attacks. Uh, so those things. In 3.1, we added baseline privacy key management. Uh, so it's, it's a secure distribution of keys um, in a PKI. So lots of security available to Doxis. Here's an example of SSD, which is secure software download. Um, vendors are going to use a code verification certificate or a CVC, CVC. And we're going to sign the images on our TFTP server. We're going to validate the images at our cable modem. And that means we'll have a nice secure uh, config file um, out to the cable modem gateway. And it all works under uh, PKI and using a, a root CA. So very good stuff here. As far as um, also we have our, our BPI encryption. So there's also uh, legacy and new, meaning legacy is a um, Doxis 3.0 or earlier, where new is 3.1 or greater. Um, so obviously the new PK contains a single root CA with intermediate CAs I was showing you earlier. Uh, stronger RSA sizes up to 4096 bit. Uh, the CSVs are issued by intermediate CAs, not the root, which makes sense. And we have international uh, in, uh, certificate in, in issuance um, from the same PKA hosted CA for China and Europe. So things are getting better on that side. Uh, for hash algorithms, I mentioned SHA-256. 
And um, this is one of the higher forms introduced in 3.1. This was designed by the National Security Agency. Uh, but the, the idea of a hash, again, making it more secure, you can see my example here on the slide. Backward compatibility, I thought of Back to the Future, one of my favorite movies. Uh, you know, so a cable modem needs certificates issued. And, um, and that's from the legacy P PKI as well as the new PKI, public key infrastructure. So two device certificates shown here. And they're installed on each cable modem. Um, and I get one for the legacy 3.0 or earlier, or 3.1 or 4.0. And the idea um, is to support both PKIs. And the CMTS must support dual certificate validation. So don't worry, you can still use those older modems and still have security. That now changes our attention over to layer two ethernet. Ethernet has some, some things in its toolbox. You've probably been using virtual local area networks for quite some time. On top of that, you can, you can add uh, EAP over LAN, 802.1x for authentication. Uh, that's the extensive authentication protocol. And that also works for wireless. And then encryption through uh, Mac layer se uh, security, which we'll talk more on right now. And you can see an example of that in the bottom right. So it looks like I'm getting bombed from some distributed denial of service attacks. Good thing my network has a little lock there. We're secure. Um, layer 2 could be a cable modem or RPD, which I have out on the right-hand side. Um, MacSec is also 802.1 AE if you wanted to you know, dig into the details a little bit more. And some people call MaxSec LinkSec, all right? So it's a point to point, right? And this prevents wiretapping, uh, denial of service, or distributed denial of service, intrusion, man in the middle, playback attacks. Uh, so it's a good addition to DOCSIS 3.1 and 4.0. Um, and it can protect the ACP as well as ARP traffic, which IPSec cannot do. Uh, Mac MacSec also um, provides origin authentication, excellent, data integrity checking, and out-of-band encryption keys and data confidentiality. And don't worry about MacSec, you can still have features like quality of service and load balancing. Okay, Even though Mac, MacSec uh, provides a point-to-point -point security on Ethernet networks, um, it is a per-hop basis. Uh, so packets are received, they are decrypted and um, enabled, uh, enabling your quality service and, and uh, load balancing features. So think of MaxSec kind of like um, IPSec layer three or SSL that protects layer seven. Uh, this is designed to protect layer two. I knew you were thinking speed. You know, even with all the MaxSec, you don't have to worry. You still supports a uh, 10 gig line rate for encryption decryption. We have uh, Galois here from from uh, a, a French mathematician that developed the encryption standard and decryption standard here uh, called GCM AES. And there's 128 bit and 256 bit available uh, for encryption of that point to point link. And then you have the key protocol, MaxSec key agreement, and you can see how that's operating in tandem with 802.1x EAP transport layer security uh, EAP over LAN, uh, which is a good thing. You could also do pre-shared key. Um, so that works as well. 802.1x uh, is integrated in the MaxSec uh, with authentication and secure device identity, which is known as 802.1ar. Um, so this thing is really loaded. And let's take a look at an example of the agreement. So you have the config pre-shared pre keys, and that's on, say, for an R RPD, a SETE, generic access platform standard, um, meaning that it's a pluggable module. It's a platform that allows all vendors to interoperate, and we can, we can enable uh, pre-shared keys. We exchange our MKA capabilities, our MACSEC key agreement capabilities, we elect a key server, um, and then we do SAC installation and assignment through SAC being a secure association key. Um, 
And then after that, uh, we are we should have success, and we're all set up. And to kind of wrap things up here, Doxus 4.0 adds method, message authentication, which is a big deal, uh, and that eliminates uh, the certificate substitution issue. We also have perfect forward secrecy through uh, elliptical curves Diffie-Hellman, um, and that's to mitigate man-in-the-middle attacks, essentially doubling the, the encryption here um, for transpa transport layer security uh, sessions. Uh, so very, very secure in 4.0, as well as algorithm agility. Remember that people are getting faster and faster devices, and, and we got quantum computing right around the corner. So you want to be able to swap out those algorithms without redesigning the whole spec. And then we have downgrade attack protection where this is the idea of trust on first use mechanism, leveraging the security parameters used uh, during a first successful authentication as a baseline for future ones. It actively prevents unauthorized use of weaker versions of a DOCSIS authentication framework. So lots of good stuff here for 4.0. I also want to mention uh, Bitcoin. Use, uh, Bitcoin public keys are created by applying elliptical curve cryptography. Uh, there's some notion out there that there's a backdoor and that the uh, NSA has something to do with it. So I encourage you to take, take a look out on the internet and see what you find. Uh, but interesting stuff. I really, really hope you uh, enjoyed my cybersecurity presentation. And uh, just to wrap up with a little bit of a uh, con conclusion here. We have to acknowledge the adversaries. They're, they're going to attack your network. Embrace the conflict. All right. You need to protect experiences of our customers. That's a credibility hit. We need to leverage the recommended practices outlined here, as well as the best practices that I outlined in Doxis, as well as Ethernet and Wi-Fi and some of the other services. Invest in workforce education and certification. SCT has an excellent cybersecurity program. Cyber, cyber security essentials. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, it's me being funny. Uh, but hey, again, if you want to reach out to me, it's sharris at sete.org. If you want some of those uh, papers I mentioned, um, I'd be happy to, to share those with you. Really appreciate your time and thank you for watching the entire presentation. I hope it, it was engaging enough for you and uh, talk to you soon and thank you very much.